Good morning, and thank you all for coming to the second day of what I think has been an extraordinary conference on unknowability. I, I hope those of you who were here yesterday agree with me that it was really quite a, a fascinating set of papers and discussions. Today we are uh, moving on to the sciences and later to the social sciences. And it is my pleasure to now not waste our time and introduce the moderator for uh, this session this morning, Natalie Walchover. Natalie is an award-winning science writer based in Brooklyn. She has covered physics for Quantum Magazine since the magazine's launch in 2013. She has previously written for Popular Science, Seed, Live Science, Make and Make Magazine, and other publications as well. She has a bachelor's degree in physics from Tufts, and during her undergraduate career, she, it was quite impressive, she co-authored peer-reviewed papers in nonlinear optics and gave talks at uh, conferences and has generally been deeply involved in the sciences and so is a perfect moderator for today's session. Natalie, it's all yours. Thank you, Ariane. Thank you all for being here uh, for what will, I'm sure, be a very edifying discussion. Uh, I'll make a few introductory remarks um, about this topic generally and then introduce the, the speakers. So you might ask, isn't science, um, isn't the basic premise of science that the universe is knowable? Um, that everything can be understood, at least in principle, nothing falls outside the kind of causal chain that we can trace back to the beginning of time. I think some people who are not scientists are skeptical of this kind of hubris of science uh, that's perpetuated by a lot of scientists themselves. Um, and there's a sense that, uh, that there are some things that cannot be understood in terms of mechanisms or reduced to constituent parts. Um, that there are unanswerable questions and unknowable things. And uh, I think in this case, the skeptics of science are actually um, clearly right. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that there are unknowable things. Um, and John Barrow gave a really good introduction to kind of overview of a lot of these subjects um, in his keynote last night, and I'll kind of touch on a few of them again. Um, a visual aid for thinking about this concept of unknowability is a painting by the German, um, German artist Paul Klee from 1927. It's called The Limits of Understanding in translation. Um, so at the bottom, there's a complicated structure made of, sorry, I should have uh, had a slide, but in a way, it's kind of fitting that you all can't see it. Um, <laughs> so at the bottom, there's this complicated structure. It's made of linear, kind of mechanical-looking pieces, and the structure climbs like a ladder. Uh, but above the contraption, and seemingly out of, out of reach from it, um, almost on a different plane, is a glowing red sphere. And uh, the contraption doesn't reach, and as an acquaintance of mine put it, you can't get there from here. So Clay painted the limits of understanding um, right at the time that physicists were discovering quantum mechanics, uh, which are the strange rules governing the behavior of elementary particles. Quantum mechanics implies that actually uh, the universe is largely unknowable. Um, in a particular sense. So exact, except for the exact moment when you measure, uh, make a measurement, say measure the location of a particle, um, except for that moment, the particle simply doesn't have a location. So before or after the measurement pins it down, um, all that exists is probabilities of, of where it could be. Um, it's possible states. So. This is what it means that the universe is not deterministic. It's inherently uncertain, um, inherently probabilistic. Physicists have been grappling with quantum mechanics and its implications for the limits of reason basically for a century. 
So that's not even my favorite example of uh, unknowability in physics, but I want to talk about some subjects closer to these speakers' hearts. So four years after Clay painted The Limits of Understanding, in 1931, an Austra Austrian logician named Kurt Gödel showed that unknowability extends to mathematics as well, the universe of numbers. Um, and this is in some sense an even more severe issue than the one I just mentioned about quantum mechanics, because even if the universe is probabilistic and uncertain, well, probably, probability theory is uh, part of mathematics, so mathematics can handle probability. Math um, was seen as, as basically comprehensive and solid and something that could be explored in full. So in the early uh, 20th century, the mathematician David Hilbert declared that all mathematical truths could be ascertained through human reasoning. And he, his slogan was, we must know, we, mil we will know. But Gödel in 1931 showed that actually we won't. So he studied a mathematical version of basically of the sentence, this sentence is a lie. Uh, and by doing that, he proved what are known as the incompleteness theorems. Um, and those showed that there are mathematical questions that cannot be answered. Um, and there are true facts about numbers that can never be ascertained, never be proven true, um, at least not with a finite number of starting assumptions. So Gödel's result meant that there um, cannot be a mathematical theory of everything. There is no basic set of, set of truths from which everything follows. Um, there are, in fact, questions that are very simple to state, um, which cannot be answered. They're undecidable. So that brings us to the work of our first speaker, Gregory Chaitin. Chaitin is a mathematician and computer scientist. He's a professor at the University of Buenos Aires and a visiting professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where he now lives. He's a creator of algorithmic information theory, the discoverer of the omega number, and the creator of the field of metabiology. He's the author of several books, including Algorithmic Information Theory and Proving Darwin. Since the 60s, Chaitin has been concerned with an undecidable problem that arises in computer science. It's called the halting problem. It asks whether a given computer program fed with an initial input will ever finish running and spit out an answer, or whether it will get into an infinite loop and never uh, halt. So the halting problem in general is un undecidable. Um, Chaitin has a constant named after him called the Chaitin's constant. He prefers to call it by the Greek symbol omega. Uh, my understanding is that it's a number that gives the probability that a random computer program will halt. So it's definable, but based on what I was just saying, it's not computable. And Chaitin will talk a bit about, the, about omega and undecidability in computer science and mathematics, as well as some other work he's been interested in. Next, we'll hear from Stuart Firestein, who's the chair of the biology department at Columbia University. I'm sorry, I'm the former chair. Oh. That's an extremely oh important <laughs> modifier. <laughs> the toppled chair of the biology department. Yeah, any way you like, but I'm not the chair anymore. Okay, uh, so he and his colleagues study the vertebrate olfactory system, seeking to answer the fundamental question, how do we smell? Uh, he investigates how the brain works using the nose and the perception of smell as a model system for understanding the complexity of the brain. Of course, his work touches on perception and therefore consciousness, which is a, of questionable status with regard to a knowability. Uh, consciousness may be a sort of epiphenomena, and maybe we, um, if Stuart doesn't talk much about that, we might talk about it a bit in the discussion. Uh, Stewart is very interested in the role of ignorance in science. His TED talk entitled The Pursuit of Ignorance has garnered uh, 1.5 million views and counting. And he's the author of uh, the books Ignorance, How It Drives Science, and Failure, Why Science is So Successful. Lastly, uh, I'd like to mention another major obstacle to our ability to know things about the world, and that's chaos. So when a system is extremely sensitive to minute details, um, as so many things are, the, the behavior of the system can't be predicted um, very far in advance. 
and can't pin down the state of the system exactly enough at any given time uh, to perfectly project how it will evolve forward to the, to the far future. The archetype of a chaotic system is the weather. Um, you've probably heard of the butterfly effect, the idea that the mere flap of a butterfly's wings can kind of set off a concatenation of events that lead to the weather to be completely different um, a, week, a week on. So if you, because you can't pin down the state of every butterfly or every cloud and gust of wind, um, the weather becomes unpredictable after more than a few days out. So climate is the average of weather. It's much more stable and more knowable than weather. Um, and yet the climate is still chaotic. It's just that it diverges from predictions maybe on a longer time scale. So small factors like adding a few hundred extra CO2 molecules per million to the atmosphere um, can cause all kinds of changes that eventually send the climate um, to a, no, a new state that's hard to predict. So Gavin Schmidt, our fir third panelist, faces this problem. Schmidt is the director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and an adjunct researcher at the Columbia Earth Institute. Gavin works on understanding past, present, and future climate change, and he develops climate models which try to project what the climate will do in the coming decades and, and centuries. He's the principal investigator on the GIS Earth System model, a climate model that uses NASA computing facilities. Um, his TED talk on climate modeling has been viewed also more than a million times. So let's begin with undecidability in math and computer science with, uh, with Gregory. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Uh, I need to, to walk. Uh, I can't stand still. Oh, not much room here. <laughs> Maybe here. Do you think this will work or it's unsafe? Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here. The pleasure is because one of my favorite books, I believe, was written here during the Second World War. I'm referring to Jacques Adamar. Uh, the Psychology of Invention in the Mathematical Field. Uh, he was a refugee here. Uh, and uh, I think it's a fascinating book. So uh, for me, this is like visiting a, a sacred place. Um, OK, I'd like to talk about unknowability actually in three fields. Uh, the, the topic of unknowability in mathematics was covered very well by John Barrow's plenary lecture, and Natalie also gave an, a very nice summary. So I think I'll talk about something a little different. Uh, probability theory, there are several fields in mathematics which deal with unknowability. One of them, of course, is probability theory. Probability theory is a wonderful theory. It goes back to letters exchanged between Pascal and um, um, Fermat. Um, and my favorite book on probability theory, which I wish I had a copy of, uh, is by Laplace, written uh, shortly after the French Revolution. And the title uh, in English is something like Philosophical Essay on pr pr Theory of Probabilities or Probabilities or something like that. Or Chance, it's something like It's a wonderful book. It's still, I think, uh, is important to read. And probability theory in the sciences has a, a great noble tradition. Uh, let me refer to, uh, Lud, um, to, to Boltzmann. Uh, Boltzmann said that in his opinion, the greatest scientist of the 1900s, uh, well, I think Maxwell certainly deserves to be included there, as John Barrow pointed out yesterday. But in Boltzmann's opinion, the greatest scientist of the, 19, of the 1800s was Darwin precisely because he introduced probability and randomness in a fundamental role in science, which of course is part of the theory that not everybody believes in, that we emerge by random mutation subject to selection. Okay, and inspired perhaps by Darwin, Boltzmann went on to create, be one of the main creators of statistical mechanics, which is a wonderful field uh, uh, statistical methods are, are deep, deeply applied in, in physics. Uh, and Boltzmann is one of the first people who started that, uh, that wonderful approach. Um, so what about, um, 
So probability theory, however, uh, does not uh, it does not deal with mathematical truths. Mathematical truths seem to be black or white, right? They're, 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 they don't have any random aspect. Uh, a statement about the prime numbers, uh, a definite statement either is true or false. We may not know, but it's one or the other. So actually it turns out that um, there is a kind of randomness that takes place in pure mathematics too that I'd like to tell you about. So uh, this is a new kind of probability theory, not the traditional one. But first let me mention that there is, besides probability theory, there is a more modern theory about unknowability in pure mathematics, and it's called metamathematics, associated with names that we've heard many times already, uh, Hilbert, Gödel, Turing, among others. Um, and the area I work in, is, I like to call algorithmic information theory, and the star, in my opinion, of algorithmic information theory is a number, a real number, called the halting probability omega that Natalie was kind enough to refer to. So what makes this number interesting is that it's a place in pure mathematics which does a perfect simulation of a physical randomness, like independent tosses of a fair coin, with mathematical truth. Mathematical truths are not supposed to be contingent, they're supposed to be, what is it, a priori, they're supposed to be black or white. And um, they're necessary truths, right? And this number called uh, the whole thing probability omega is a probability, so it's between zero and one, and if you specify the computer you're working with, you pick a program at random, and you ask what is the probability that eventually it'll halt in a finite amount of time, and that's a number between zero and one. Zero would be no program holds, one would be every program holds, and in fact some do and some don't. Okay, and the problem is to determine the numerical value of this number, which has such a simple definition. If you write this number in binary, it turns out that the individual zero, one bits of the numerical value of this number, which has such a simple definition, and is a one specific number, mathematically well-defined, it turns out that they're sort of maximally unknowable. These bits, the, the fact that the fifth bit of the numerical value of this number, this halting probability, is a zero or a one, is a perfect simulation within the world of, uh, the platonic, platonic world of pure mathematics of independent tosses of a fair coin. It's not random, it's determined, I mean, to God or to uh, an infinite mind, but for us it looks, it looks maximally unknowable. So this is sort of an extreme case of the phenomenon first discovered by Gödel and in another form by Turing. Uh, and in studied in mathematics, metamathematics. Now, this number I want to use as a springboard into biology, with apologies to this is crazy stuff. Uh, um, I'm fascinated by biology, and I feel very bad that there is no fundamental mathematical theory of biology the way there are fundamental mathematical theories in physics, of which John Barrow has already movingly referred to yesterday. We believe that there are, sim we may not know them all, but we believe that there are simple lo mathematical laws which determine the whole physical universe, right? Biology is not at all that way. Mathematics doesn't seem to apply. We do have, uh, what is it called, systems biology, right? Which are very complicated um, computer simulations of, um, of complicated uh, uh, biological systems, like parts of a cell. But we don't have a fundamental mathematical theory of biology, in my, in my opinion. I would like a proof, for example, that Darwinian evolution is capable of explaining all the variety we see here. Or that it isn't, which is another possibility, right? I would like a proof one way or another. And I don't have such a proof, but I have a proposal. The proposal starts with a beautiful idea of John von Neumann, 1948 lecture published in 1951, The General and Logical Theory of Automata. And what von Neumann points out in that remarkable, uh, remarkably forgotten paper is that the fundamental mathematical idea in biology and in computer technology is the same idea. It's the idea of software. It's software that explains the plasticity of computer technology and is why computer technology has been so revolutionary. And it's software that explains the plasticity of the biosphere and which is how remarkable creatures such as ourselves are able to evolve. It's the same idea. So to put it more paradoxically, nature discovered software billions of years before we did, okay? Uh, we are, contain very, very ancient software. 
Um, now, what can one do with this idea mathematically, which I think is the key idea? Well, on <laughs> You know, to do a mathematical theory of, of real biology is too complicated. Math, pure math cannot deal with, with such a messy situation. So I propose, instead of doing a mathematical, fundamental mathematical theory of biology, which studies the uh, effect of random mutations on DNA, I propose to do a mathematical theory which studies the effect of random mutations on computer software. It's analogous to the the biological problem. Uh, DNA is biological software, after all. And it is tractable mathematically. So to put it uh, a little more precisely, um, a, a theory that I'm proposing, I like to call it metabiology, um, looks at, um, tries to study life as a random walk in software space. Okay? That's the kind of mathematics that, um, that it looks at. And a few of us in Brazil at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro worked on this. Um, um, my graduate student, Felipe Abraham, my wife who looks at it from the point of view of epistemology, and myself. And there's a little book called Proving Darwin that's also in Japanese, Chinese, Italian, Spanish, and English uh, with the proposal. And I'm very happy to say that Quantum Magazine, which is a magazine that I admire greatly, recently had an article about all of this because of some wonderful new work in this area being done by people outside our group, in particular by Hector Zanil, who's a very active researcher in Europe with a, a fairly large group of collaborators. Uh, there was recently an article about this in Quanta. So, um, so this is... And John Barrow referred yesterday that um, Emile uh, Dubois Raymond thought we problems of origin of life and, th and proving that evolution works or doesn't is not on that list, but it's close to things on that list. So, so this is, I think, as close as we can get to fundamental mathematics in biology. I would. Uh, this is my proposal for dealing with the. Unknowability from a mathematical point of view of biology due to its enormous, horrendous uh, mess. That <laughs> but it's a wonderful mess. We're all here, right? I'm in favor, right? I have a wife, I have a child, so I'm in favor of messy biology. But, uh, but mathematically, it's difficult to comprehend. Okay, so now I want to talk about another kind of a, now I would like to go from biology to physics. Um, last month, just a few days ago, at the end of March, was the 30th anniversary of a remarkable circus which took place at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, which was a press conference by a very distinguished electrochemist, a British electrochemist called Martin Fleischmann, and his younger colleague Stanley Pons. They announced a remarkable source of energy in an electrochemical cell, so much energy that they said it could not have a chemical origin, it had to have a nuclear origin. And so on Time Magazine you saw a cover saying, uh, I don't know, fusion in a test tube and everything. So this, this became totally notorious. Uh, this was quickly debunked. Um, uh, the two, the two uh, professors resigned from the university. They fled the country. Uh, Martin Fleischmann went back to live in England, which is probably not a bad th thing to do, actually, m m perhaps more pleasant than the deserts of Utah. I love Utah. I've hiked in Utah. But anyway, and Stanley Pons actually w uh, went to France and resigned his U.S. citizenship even. So uh, it was really a pretty serious matter, and this became a traditional example of junk science, right? Either, either the scientists were totally misled or else... Um, it was uh, a deliberate uh, con job. That was the, the opinion of the world. Now, this is the opinion that prevails in many countries, in many parts of the world. But strangely enough, there are places in the world where there is a different opinion about all of this. So let me tell you what is going on in Japan, which, strangely enough, very few people seem to know about. In Japan, there is a national effort. They have. They have continued working on this area, 
and considerably developed it. And they have announced a national program to save the world from uh, the greenhouse effect, from global warming, using more sophisticated versions of this 30-year-old idea that was uh, rejected. And they have been doing this sort of quietly. For example, they don't call it cold fusion, God forbid. They call it new hydrogen energy, I think, which is a good neutral term. And to indicate how serious this effort is, if you look up Mitsubishi and you look up Clean Planet in Google, Mitsubishi Clean Planet and Tohoku University, Tohoku, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, T-O-H-O-K-U, I think it is, is the MIT of Japan, if I'm not mistaken, have a joint project to save the world from global warming. And this is announced publicly. You can find using Google, I think the first thing when I looked with those words, came up a press release announcing a collaboration between Mitsubishi, um, Cold Planet, and um, Tohoku University actually has a department in the university devoted to these studies, believe it or not. So I think it's very interesting that something which uh, in some parts of the world, if you mention it, you know, will be a career stopper, in other parts of the world has a national program with tremendous political and economic strength behind it. And if you look at the website of Clean Planet, um, in Japan they are saying very clearly they're going to save the world. That is their aim. Um, so, and somehow it's not too well known here. And if I still have, do I still have a few minutes? Couple minutes. If I have a couple of minutes, why stop now since already my career is destroyed? Uh, uh, let me end by talking about an American researcher. He has his own private institute called, I think it's Randall or Randall Mills. And um, he believes he understands what the dark matter is. That's something that seems pretty unknowable, dark matter, right? It turns out there is somebody here who thinks he has, a, he has some interesting experimental evidence, I think, um, that he knows what the dark matter is. So what is the dark matter according to Randall Mills? Well, the, Randall Mills believes that in the, the solar corona is much hotter than the surface of the sun. You know, it's on the order of a million degrees and the surface of the sun is what, 3,000, 6,000 K? Something like that. So where does this energy come from? Well, Randall Mill believes he knows. He believes it's hydrogen becoming a more compact form of hydrogen. He calls the hydrino, H-Y-D-R-I-N-O. This seems to be his, Randall Mills' baby, the hydrino. Good way to search for him. And the hydrino is below what is conventionally considered to be the ground strait of hydrogen. The electron is closer to the proton than conventional quantum theory allows. And Randall Mills believes that this is how the solar corona works, and he has, believes that he's repeated it in his lab and proposes this as a way of generating tremendous energy. In effect, you have a piece of the solar corona in your lab or hopefully in your commercial industrial device generating heat. And um, the, he's presented uh, evidence that I think is very tantalizing that, for example, the spectrum of light emitted when he does this reaction in his lab looks very much like the spectrum of light you get when you measure the deep UV part of the solar corona, which has to be done in satellites because it doesn't go through the atmosphere. So, so Randall Mills, this is interesting. All of this is interesting from the point of new, new technology and so saving the world from global warming because these, these things don't produce radiation and they don't produce carbon dioxide, right? No greenhouse effect. But they're also fascinating scientifically because um, if Randall Mills is right, quantum mechanics needs to be modified, which is fascinating. He goes back to the initial thought experiment that created quantum mechanics. The initial thought experiment is that the hydrogen atom should be unstable according to Maxwell's equations because when you have an electron going around a proton, it's accelerating. It's curving. So that should emit immediate radiation and the electron should spiral in right to the proton. So hydrogen atoms should be unstable. Uh, and quantum mechanics was invented to get around this problem. Well it turns out according to Mills, Maxwell's equations are good enough. You didn't need to invent a new physics. You, classical physics works. If the electron is some kind of a thing that I don't understand completely, he calls it an orbisphere. 
the electron is sort of like a sphere of electron around the proton. And this turns out to be some, his professor at MIT had done work on solutions to Maxwell's equations um, which don't emit radiation, even though they, you, you might be afraid they would. So, so I think this is uh, very fascinating stuff. Um, and it emphasizes the sociology of science. The fact that something is regarded as a national imperative um, in a country like Japan, which has no petroleum and which had a disaster in Fujiyama, but is an unmentionable subject in other areas, um, is interesting from a sociological point of view, sociology of science. You know, the, it, it doesn't help us with the idea of absolute truth. Absolute truth may exist, but what, you know, the scientific establishment in different parts of the world regards as the truth may depend, as we pointed out yesterday, on political factors, on sociological factors. And that's a field called the sociology of science. And I think this, these, the, these examples are interesting test cases to, to look at from a philosophical point of view, whichever way it comes out, you know. So I think there'll be interesting times ahead. Uh, if any of this is at all right, uh, it's revolutionary, and it might also just happen to save our lives with global warming. And if not, it's a very interesting uh, piece of the history of ideas. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, great pleasure to be here. Thanks to Arian and, and her tremendous staff for organizing this. Thank you all for coming out, and it's a wonderful opportunity to spread some interesting ideas around. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about biology, even though I'm the biologist, but fortunately Greg took care of that for me um, and did a marvelous job of it as well. I'll do a little bit of biology at the end, but I do want to talk a little bit more about uh, ignorance and failure, this sort of little niche that I've um, carved out for myself, it seems, uh, and it's and it's uh, its relationship to unknowability in science. So, and I'll try and integrate that with some biology as well. Um, right. So let's see. Just start here. So, in uh, 1928, this is a famous uh, biologist, in fact, computational biologist, a revolutionary computational biologist, one of the earliest people to use mathematics in biology, J. B. S. Haldane, who famously said, um, "Not only is the universe uh, queerer than we imagine, it is queerer than we can imagine." And this has been taken over the years, I think, wrongly, by the way, to be a sort of a statement about a kind of cognitive limitation as to what we can imagine, what we can think of what we can know, um, a, a sense of humility or whatever about this. Um, in, in fact, I think this is not the right interpretation for what Haldane meant. Uh, for one, right before that sentence, but never quoted with it, uh, he says, I have no doubt that in reality the future will be vastly more surprising than anything I can imagine. So I think Haldane was looking forward to being surprised. His notion of um, queerer than we can imagine, although I must say I don't think any queerer than that suit that he's got on, <laughs> wherever he got that from, um, nonetheless means that it's not unknowable, it's not impossible, uh, but rather that we're unable to imagine it from our current platform, which is true today as well. We, there are things we surely will not be able to imagine from our current platform of understanding. And in fact, since he made that statement in 1928, um, quite a number of very difficult to imagine things have been imagined by scientists and, and others. Um, that's just a short, a very short list of them. But it's clear that in the, I'll go on from there. I'll go on with that. There, there have been other similar statements like this. this. is one of my favorites, not only because it's Shakespeare and, and from Hamlet and all that, but because it also dates from a period that we typically believe was kind of the beginning of what we call the scientific revolution, the current scientific revolution. Uh, so Shakespeare and Francis Bacon, as you know, lived more or less at the same time. Some people think they were the same person, of course. But in any case, um, it dates from then. Uh, it's interesting, this phrase, there are more things in heaven and earth a ratio than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Actually, the first folio edition, the earliest edition, said our philosophy. The Y <laughs> seemed to have gotten added later on, presumably by some actor improvising. But in any case, another, another uh, statement of this that I like is from Douglas Adams. Uh, 
uh, four book trilogy, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is the second of the four books in which he says there's a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it's here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is a second theory that goes with this, which is that this has already happened. <laughs> and so, um, I think he has that right. So this is a phrase that I that I like. It's a, a apocryphal saying, but I find it an apt description of science and the, sci the real scientific method, which is to say that it's very hard to find a black cat in a dark room, especially when there is no cat, which is so often the case. And so I think this is exactly how science works and how it deals with the so-called unknowable. We stomp around in black rooms and eventually perhaps step on a cat that has been reported to be in the area. The report may be reliable or unreliable, but nonetheless, we may find this critter or we may find some other critter entirely. But once having decided the room is either empty or full of a cat, we simply move on to the next dark room, as it were. And this is how science proceeds, I think, on and on. I'll also quote um, from Maxwell, who has been pointed out now by several of our speakers who have been arguably the greatest physicist between Einstein and, uh, between Newton and Einstein, who uh, praised ignorance, uh, again, by saying thoroughly conscious ignorance is the prelude to every real advance in science. And so this is the kind of ignorance that I'm talking about, not the common usage of the word ignorance, uh, not stupidity or willful indifference to fact or logic. You know who I'm talking about. Um, but, but rather uh, this thoroughly conscious kind of ignorance that can be developed. So I just want to talk about that for a moment more. Um, I think we, we commonly believe that we begin not knowing something, we begin with ignorance, and then we do something, an experiment, or go to a class or a lecture and gain, therefore, knowledge from that. But I think it's important to recognize that the arrow goes the other way as well. The big question for me really is, okay, we've gained some knowledge, what does one do with that knowledge? And the purpose of that knowledge, in my opinion, is to create better ignorance, if you will, because there's low quality ignorance and high quality ignorance. Um, this is what scientists talk about all the time. In fact, sometimes they're bull sessions, sometimes they're grant proposals, <laughs> sometimes you cannot tell the difference, I admit. But nonetheless, this is what, what we argue about is the quality of the ignorance, or if you will, the question. So the purpose of knowledge is to frame a better, a more sophisticated, a deeper question, if you will. This is I.I. Uh, I. Robbie, who's a famous physicist uh, at Columbia University. He was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1944 for his work on his discovery and development of uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, techniques still important in chemistry laboratories today and of course which eventually gave us the di medical diagnostic tool uh, known as MRI. Um, Robbie, who I never met, was at Columbia, but I never met him. Um, he passed away before I got there, but, but it was reported to have enjoyed telling a story of when he was a young well, I think it's important to say a young immigrant child growing up on the Lower East Side of New York, and when he and his friends would come home from school, their mothers would ask them, so what did you learn today? Uh, except that Robbie's mother, Mrs. Robbie, asked him, uh, so Isidore, did you ask any good questions today? Hmm. And I think Mrs. Robbie had the right idea, and Izzy went on to win a Nobel Prize, know about his friends, I assume they did okay too, but it's this notion of uh, asking a good question. How do we ask a good question? So if science and many other scholarly pursuits, in my opinion, is the search for better ignorance, then how do we do that? And I like the, in particular this phrase negative capability, which sounds a bit oxymoronic, but actually comes from the, the rather dreamy-eyed poet here, John Keats, in a letter to his brother in which he defined this term negative capability as being when a man, person I guess we would say today, I hope, is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. And he considered this to be the ideal creative state. I believe it's true in science as well, not just in the literary uh, field. It's this notion of being patient with ignorance, of, of, of being patient with mystery and uncertainty, because this is where new discoveries and new ideas uh, come from. So all right, so we have the unknown, and then of course the, <clears throat> the theme of this conference is the dreaded unknown unknown. Um, 
or the unknown square at some hour or another. And then there's this character who's shown up now several times, of course, because he's notorious for having used this phrase, the unknown unknowns, to uh, try and excuse the uh, disaster that was the, um, his engineered uh, uh, foray into Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and yesterday we were told by Marina that there's actually a much earlier uh, version of this, and I'm happy to say that there's an even earlier version of this that, that I discovered some years ago, which I particularly like, and that actually shows up in, a, in an epic poem uh, called New Heaven and Earth, uh, written or at least published in 1917 by D.H. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. It's a rather lengthy poem. It's not to my taste personally, to tell you the truth, but it's about the transition from this plane of existence to the next plane, the next higher plane of existence, should such a thing exist. And near the end of it, there's a stanza that goes, now here was I, new awakened, with my hand stretching out and touching the unknown, the real unknown, the unknown unknown. To my knowledge, this is actually the first use of the phrase, the unknown unknown, and it's uh, by a poet. So there you go. Um, so how do you get to this unknown unknown? How do you get to this deeper kind of ignorance? Uh, and I would say one portal, a slim one perhaps, but one portal into this deep ignorance, this unknown unknown, is through failure. So again, I don't mean failure in many of the common senses of the word. I don't, I don't mean, oh, let me use this quote from Benjamin Franklin. So I have this talk is sort of full of quotes I realize, and I don't mean to gain any particular authority that way. I just think that if people said something smart, they shouldn't be left out of the conversation just because they're dead, um, which happens. And I think it's also important to realize that the conversation has been going on for some time and will continue to go on as well. So Benjamin Franklin, arguably um, America's first scientist, said perhaps the history of ours, or if you will, failures of mankind, all things considered, is far more valuable and interesting than that of their discoveries. Because truth is kind of narrow and uniform, whereas you know there are endless ways of screwing up. So it's much more diverse and much more interesting. This is. Can you hand me that bottle of water? This is sometimes referred to as the uh, Anna Karenina principle. You know, Tolstoy was asked why he always wrote about unhappy families, and his answer was that happy families are all happy in pretty much the same way. But unhappy families find thousands of ways to be unhappy, so there's a lot more to write about. And I think the same thing is true with, with failure in this sense. But again, now, I don't mean failure in the common sort of self-help ways that we use it, you know, failure is an opportunity to succeed again, or perseverance, or all these other kinds of tropes that we use with failure, which are fine, I think, if you have someone on the phone who's just failed in love, or sport, or business, or something like that. But, but I mean a different kind of failure. Um, that we use in science. And so I'm going to use uh, yet another quote from the enigmatic, the always enigmatic Gertrude Stein, who says, a real failure does not need an excuse. It is an end in itself. I think the notion of a failure as an end in itself is absolutely a crucial idea. And to add yet another layer of the enigmatic to it, I'll use Samuel Beckett, who in a late novel writes, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, and then adds two words, fail better. Not succeed, but fail better. So can we fail better? Is it possible to work on failure, to fail better? Of course, I, I believe it is. So I think the important notion here is that failure is not only valuable retrospectively, because it eventually led to some success or some discovery or unexpected discovery or something serendipitous, but rather it, it's integral to the process of science. It's, it's epistemologically as valuable as success. We gain not only, we don't just learn from failure, but we gain insight from failures. Um, Failure uh, cannot, should not, be left out or avoided, and it can be utilized and improved. Um, it gives us a kind of a confidence in the proceedings, uh, in, in, in the, the endeavor of science. If it just always succeeded, you wouldn't really trust it, would you? I wouldn't, anyway. So, so I want to leave you quickly with two key ideas about failure and ignorance, and then try and go on from there in the next seven minutes. So the, for ignorance, this notion of negative capability, which I think is something that we really need to develop in, in students and in scientists and in society in general, this, this ability to remain patient in mystery and doubt and understand that that is part of living, that you just don't know everything and won't know everything. And then the failure is an end in itself, and one can be better at it. Um, 
So those two ideas, I think, are key about ignorance and failure, if you will. So this leads me then, or I hope it leads us, but it leads me anyway, to consider the notion of uncertainty, um, because that's part of unknowability is uncertainty. And, and it seems to me to be not only important in science, but it's become sort of politically or socially an important issue as well, as we'll hear about when we talk about climate change and things like that. So, so there's certain kinds of uncertainty that we, of course, enjoy, right? I mean, uh, uh, if you play poker or you're a betting person or you like sports, um, you don't really want to know the outcome of any of those things before they happen. Happen. We have these so-called spoiler alerts. I don't think anybody in the room here would love to know the exact time and date of their death. That's kind of morbid, right? So these sorts of uncertainties are of interest to us. But I would say these are fundamentally different than uncertainty in science, because these things all finally resolve. At some point, the hand is played, the roulette ball falls, the, the game is over, the score is recorded, and I'm sorry to say that at some point, there will be a piece of paper in some county um, place, you know, some county office with the exact date and time of your death on it. Um, science, I think, has a somewhat grander sense of uncertainty, if you will, captured a little bit by this haiku from the famous Japanese poet uh, Basho. Um, because in science, there may very well be no ultimate solution, no lasting resolution, no guaranteed complete answer, or no final solution, a phrase we should all be worried about, I think, uh, these days. And so this is not really what science, what should be the purpose or the goal of science, the aim of science. Uh, rather, we work, as, as uh, John pointed out last night in his talk, to develop sort of stable probabilities. Um, the idea is not to just keep doing experiments until you get to a prior of zero or one. You either know or you don't know, and that's the end of it. But rather that there are in the world stable probabilities that we can know about. Indeed, the certainty of authority uh, uh, is, in my opinion, very anti-progress, very anti-science. So certainty is not really a good idea. Progress lies in, indeed, in uncertainty. Immutable facts, things written in stone, tend to be impediments to progress. So I think the question is not how we become certain, but how we get on so successfully as we do while accepting uncertainty. Uh, there's a famous, um, engineer George Box, who talked about models, because we all use models in science, and he said, well, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And they're useful as long as they're useful, and then we get rid of them and supplant them with another model, but they're always wrong. Uh, and that in science, importantly, revision is a victory. I think that's a crucial idea, that in science, revision is a victory. So where did this growth of uncertainty come from? It's interesting, I think, and it was alluded to by, by Gregory in, in his talk, that um, the early version of science, as we know it, Western science as we know it, with uh, people like Kepler and Galileo, uh, Newton, et cetera, um, and chemistry, Lavoisier, Dalton, and so forth, uh, had a very deterministic, almost hubristic uh, viewpoint. That is that um, we could recognize, we, the world was a deterministic place, and we could predict the future given sufficient computation power. But that, that transitioned, if you will, into this more probabilistic and uncertain world. And I actually believe that that occurred initially, as Gregory sort of pointed out, in biology of all places, at least partly, I think, because biology was... Um, Biology was able to use teleology, sort of purposeful explanation as a mode of explanation much longer than any other science. Uh, teleology continued to be somehow considered useful in biology well after it was given up in physics and, and chemistry. So you could explain a lot of biology by, by reference to purpose. Something was there because of it had this purpose. It wanted to do this. Until Darwin, of course. And Darwin does, for the first time, show us an entirely probabilistic world that highly complex highly complex systems or beings can, um, can arise from random events and selection, or what we would, I guess, now call feedback. And, and that idea, in 1859, took some time to be recognized regularly worldwide, maybe still isn't, but that idea was followed upon very rapidly by people like Boltzmann and statistical mechanics, Einstein and the dualisms and uncertainties of, of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, chaos theory, which we'll hear more about, and of course even uh, Gödel and uh, the foundations of the queen of science is mathematics. So 
the thing is, though, somewhat counterintuitively, I think, this transition from determinism to probabilistic thinking actually has served to strengthen science. It, it, uh, it continues to generate increasingly accurate, what I call credibly incredible uh, descriptions of the universe. Uh, more importantly, it continues to generate increasingly more interesting and compelling questions. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit to biology now to suggest to you also that our sort of mid-century uh, flirtation with reductionism, our interest in reductionism in particular in biology, actually does not lead to anything simpler or anything more deterministic as you might think. Indeed, it often just gets more complicated as you get more reductionist. So I'm going to give you two quick examples. I think I can do that in three minutes here. One is, uh, and, and a quick biology lesson, one has to do with what are called ion channels. Ion channels are proteins which sit in the membranes of your cells. This, this is the membrane, this is the ion channel. It's a protein that sits in membranes. It, it's prevalent in almost all cells, but it's particularly important in the cells of your brain. This is as close to consciousness as I'm getting, by the way, because Nick Humphreys is going to talk later, and he knows about consciousness. Um, so these, these ion channels sit in the neurons in your brain, and they have the property of being able to be either open and allow then a pore to form so that these ions, these charged electrical particles, can flow into or out of the cell, or they can be closed, in which case these charged particles can't flow into or out of the cell because the lipid membrane is a very good insulator. These ion channels can be pushed into the open state by a variety of ways, chemicals such as neurotransmitters, hormones, drugs, etc., or in some cases by electrical effects. They're sensitive to voltages that develop across the membrane. And at some voltages, they'll tend to be open and others closed. Here's an, I, I know, unfortunately complicated looking thing, but it's not so complicated. I'll just go through it very quickly and easily. This, these are traces of ion channels. Remarkably, and almost unimaginably, we're able to actually look at single ion channels opening and closing by a technique known as patch clamping. It's not important, the details of it. And that's what these are records of. So this is a closed channel, and this is when the channel is open, because we can see the ions going through. We can record the electrical flow of current as ions go through it. This particular channel, so up here is what we're stimulating the cell with some voltage. So here it's at minus 100 millivolts, and then we step it rapidly to about plus 50 millivolts for 40 milliseconds and then back again. And we do this again and again and again with a pause of maybe a second or so between each one of these pulses of voltage. And so these are nine iterations of doing that over a period of time. And what you can see then is the channel tends to be more open when the cell is at plus 50 millivolts than when it's at minus 100 millivolts. But what's critical to see here is that it's completely stochastic. There is a bias for the channel to be open. It's highly more probable. It's about a 70% probability that the channel will be open at 100 millivolts and a much lower, about a 10% probability that it will be open at minus 100 millivolts. But, but at any one time, if I just went down these channels at any one time, I could not tell you if I looked whether the channel would be open or closed. It is entirely, entirely stochastic. There is no way to predict it. Nonetheless, over a large number of channels, which you have, hundreds of thousands of them, you can see a current develop in a very, very predictable way. And so you have a predictable average, but you have individual uh, randomness and, and complete randomness. These are just two more examples of channels, which I hope show you they're also random somehow or another. Uh, a similar situation, and this is my only, the second and last example, is what's called the logistic function, which functions quite a bit in biology, from descriptions of single molecules all the way up to whole organisms, living people or animals or things like that. And it simply describes the likelihood of a response from zero to 100%, let's say, uh, in a, a likelihood of a response to some, some stimulation. So this, this axis here could be the dose of a drug, the intensity of a stimulus can even be time. So for example, if I flash a light at you, I say I'm gonna flash a light every, um, every 30 seconds, I'm gonna flash a light, and it could be very dim or very bright, and you tell me if you see the flash. Well, if it's very dim, you won't see it very often, but now and again, you will report seeing it. But if it's very bright, you'll see it almost every time, and you'll report seeing it 
almost every time. But but in any given one of these trials, it's impossible to predict whether you will or will not see it. And at the, say the 50% level, that simply means that at this intensity here of the light, 50% of the time you'll report seeing it and 50% of the time you will report not seeing it. And there was no way for me to know, or you for that matter, to know whether any given one time you will report it this way or that way. Nonetheless, it follows this curve quite precisely. So even at the most reductionist levels or the highest levels, this kind of randomness um, uh, rules in, in biology. Right, this is the end of it. Um, I think this unknowability is fundamentally an optimistic idea, though, uh, and, and this is what I sort of want to uh, want to leave you with: that that uh, relieved of this um, hubristic promise to discover the truth, the ultimate solution, science can actually now progress far more pluralistically, uh, iteratively proceeding from what Catherine Elgin, a philosopher of science, calls felicitous falsehood to felicitous falsehood, uh, always being true enough to support continued progress. Um, and as long as science generates questions, ever more sophisticated, ever deeper questions, then it will continue indeed, I believe, indefinitely. So progress, I think, should not be seen as accumulating facts, but deepening the questions uh, while occasionally solving a problem or two. What is it that we can know about unknown unknowns? Well, we can know that there are unknown unknowns and that there always will be because we can't conceive of the new knowledge that could be created from the stance of our current knowledge. Uh, people in the early 20th century didn't have any idea about whether the internet or nuclear energy was likely or unlikely. They just had no idea about it at all. It would be inconceivable to them. Um, these unknown unknowns are, for me, a source of optimism in a society that seeks not only technological achievement, but deepening understanding. I'm going to finish with this very quick story of the, the story of the condemned prisoner, which I know doesn't sound so optimistic, but actually it is. And it's about a condemned prisoner who pleads with the king for his life, to reprieve him for a year, uh, because within that year he promises that he can teach the king's horse to talk. The king says, okay. That night, a fellow prisoner says, what possessed you to make such a crazy bargain? I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? So the fellow says, well, you know, a lot can happen in a year. The horse might die. The king might die. I might die. The horse might learn to talk. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows, right? So because he recognized, of course, that his real problem was insufficient knowledge. He just didn't know what could yet be possible or what could happen. But he was optimistic, this prisoner, that things that he doesn't, uh, that he can't predict the way things will work out in the future, that opportunities and solutions that he can't possibly see may arise. So this prisoner is optimistic, in my opinion, because he remains open to the possibilities of the future, um, possibilities that he, like J.B.S. Haldane, cannot imagine. So, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so, all of those talks have been actually quite good introductions to what I'm going to talk about. And uh, so, I'm really going to talk about unknowability in the context of, of the climate, which is what I work on, and so I, I know something about that. Uh, but it turns out that a lot of the, uh, the lessons uh, to be gained from looking at this particular one example of science is actually, I think, um, have a lot of uh, generality. So uh, let, let's think about what we, what we mean by the climate. Now, the, the scales involved in, in, in the climate, the things that affect uh, the climate, uh, range from the very, very, very small, you know, the, the, the nucleating particles of an individual crowd dot cloud droplet uh, all the way out to to the size of the planet itself and that's about t uh, 14 orders of magnitude right so <coughs> powers of 10 14 powers of 10 right that's a massive range and the same uh, scale is, is is visible in the in the time scales like things happen very very fast microsecond levels when you when you form a cloud or when uh, you know a photon is, is absorbed by a greenhouse gas or something uh, out to millennia because those are the kind of scales that we really care about so again 14 orders of magnitude in time and in space. There's a massive range of physics uh, that we don't actually have a single theory that, that is valid at all of those scales. Right? 
Uh, so, uh, so what we do uh, instead of, of having theories is we use computers, right? So we uh, we basically code up these things. This is uh, uh, you would be pleased to know is not a current uh, comp computer model. It's uh, some of you might recognise this. Right? It's a punch card. Back in the old days when we uh, we used to have to put in like one punch card at all, no keyboards, no screens. You, it, it's unimaginable, in fact. Um, uh, but uh, these were this was a climate model. This box was a, was a whole climate model, and each of those coloured things was a subroutine. You have to put it in an order. If you got it wrong, you'd have to start all over again. Uh, a very uh, a very uh, a time consuming thing. But we've been we've been working on these computer models, as you can tell, for about forty years. So um, there are three main limits uh, to knowledge in climate science. Right? Uh, so one that, that was mentioned earlier is, is, is chaos. So chaos is, is not just a generic kind of word that, Im, that implies the lack of order, but it's a very specific phenomena that happens in mathematical systems. And I'll, I'll give you an example uh, later on. Um, the other reason why we don't know something is because of structural uncertainty in our conception of what's going on, right? So there's all those scales of motion and time. Uh, we have to make approximations because we don't have a single theory that does all of those things. And people make approximations in different ways. That leads to different models, and there's a variation of results that come from those different models. And then possibly the most interesting reason why uh, we, we have uh, unknowability in climate science is because the results of our science are impacting society, which means that things that we predict are then being uh, acted upon to perhaps make them worse or perhaps make them not happen at all. So you don't need convincing. You can, you, I mean, I'm sure you've all looked at uh, weather maps. This is, a, this is a computer model of the amount of water vapor in the, in the atmosphere. And, uh, and what you can see, you can see the storm systems uh, going around Antarctica and in the North Atlantic. Uh, you can see the rain bands uh, in the, uh, uh, you can see an atmospheric river there kind of hitting, uh, hitting California. Um, and you can see that this is a highly complex, highly chaotic uh, simulation, right? And uh, and it isn't so, so chaos. There was a couple of couple of cyclones there. You can see uh, in the in the Pacific, uh, and this is all being generated by the model. Right? There's no there's no um, there's no component in the model that says do something very complicated. It's just very simple things that are all interacting in ways that make the emergent properties of that system extremely complex. Um, now. I'll, I'm going to show you like a, a whole set of model results here, and, and so these are trends in rainfall, 50-year yeah, trends. How much <coughs> how much the rainfall is going to change from a single model? Right? So there's no uncertainty uh, uh, comparing different models to to the real world, and and this is there's no real data in here. So this is just a model result. Now the difference between each of these 50 postage stamps that I'm going to show you is the tiniest change in the initial conditions. The tiniest change that you can make, a change in one number at the 16th decimal place, is the only change between these two, these, all these pictures. Right. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. There's four, there's four T things. So these are the 50-year trends over North America in the sing, same model, but with the tiniest, tiniest change right at the beginning. And that's this sensitive uh, sensitivity to initial conditions that was that was mentioned before. Now I'll, I'll bring out two of them, uh, the two at the bottom there. Um, this is you know version 39 and version 40. They're almost completely opposed to each other, right? So this is unknowability. We don't know what's going to happen. I can't predict what's going to happen ahead of time because it depends so sensitively on those initial conditions. Now, the average trend, right, if you average all of those 40, uh, 40 members, uh, you can see that some places do have predictable trends. You look at the rainfall change in Alaska, right? Um, it turns out that that's the same in almost all of the runs, right? That's a predictable part of that because the uncertainty because of the chaos is small. The deterministic signal is large, and so we can say something about what we know uh, about trends in, uh, in rainfall in, in Alaska, and in fact, uh, most of the Arctic. Uh, but, the, uh, but the trends in the mid-latitudes are essentially random, right? So we have an, a limit to knowledge that is really tied to a very, very specific phenomena, this, 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 this idea of, of chaos. And we accept that. I mean, we, we accept that in, in weather forecasts. Uh, weather forecasts are actually getting much better 
uh, but they're pushing up against these limits. Right? So we have uncertainty in weather forecasts because we don't understand what's going on or our models aren't good enough or we haven't got enough data. Um, but you know, five-day forecasts now are as good as two-day forecasts were 30 years ago, and 10-day forecasts are as good as three-day forecasts were uh, 30 years ago. Uh, but it isn't going to increase forever. Right? So once they get to about 14 days, you're, you're going to be out of luck. It's not going to progress much further than that. Now, when you're doing these models, right, you have these, these different orders of magnitude. Let me, let me be clear about what it is that we resolve. Right? So here's, here's where weather models are. Right? They, can, they can do the big scales down to a few kilometers, and they can do the time scales you know, for, a few, uh, for a few weeks. Climate models, everything else is, is approximated. Right? That's where this notion of structural uncertainty comes from. Everything down there where I say subscale processes, that is uh, the area where it's more art than it is science. It's, it's educated guesses, but guesses nonetheless. Climate models back in the 1990s had an even smaller part of that, that pie uh, because you had to extend them out in time. We're a little bit better now, uh, but every decade we're basically increasing our ability to resolve these physics by about an order of magnitude. And so for us to be able to get all of the way to the, all of those scales in, in some kind of a priori sense, it will probably take us to the end of the century to do that, assuming uh, Moore's law keeps on going the way it has. So this was mentioned earlier on, Stuart mentioned it, it comes from George Box. All models are wrong, right? And these models, it's just obviously that they're wrong. It's because we have to approximate so much of that physics, right? It's obvious that all climate models are wrong. That is not a disputable point. But again, as, as Stuart rightly, rightly said, the issue is whether they're useful. Now, how do you measure the usefulness, the utility of a model? Right? So you measure it in terms of skill. Right? And uh, it's a very specific definition of skill. A model result is skillful if it gives you better predictions than something else. Right? It's, it's, it's a very reasonable thing. Right? You can make your own weather forecasts, but I guarantee your weather forecasts are not going to be as good as the ones coming from the National Weather Service. We can test skill. Right? We can measure that. And, uh, and so you know, we're, we're not searching for ultimate truth. We're just searching for ever more useful models. Right? And so that's why, that's why we're doing science. We're trying to find things that are more useful for something. I mean, some people like knowledge for its own sake. I'm a far more practical person. I want knowledge that's useful, right? I want knowledge that is helpful in designing technology, in designing systems, in helping people get along. Whatever it is, it has to have a use. Like right? knowledge, just for its own sake, while you know we're in academia, right? That's supposed to be what we do, uh, is not actually my my gig. Um, so, do models have skill? Right? Do, do these models have any skill? Do they do a better job of predicting what happened over the 20th century than you would have been able to guess just by you know, putting your finger in the air? And the answer is yes. What you're seeing here are the observations and a, and a set of model simulations smoothed slightly uh, to remove a little bit of the noise. The blue and the yellow bits that are flashing up and down, those, those are, that's the weather. But something's happening towards the end of the 20th century. Something else is emerging. A new pattern has occurred. And that pattern, that's the pattern of global warming, is the pattern of climate change the models can capture. They are skillful at doing that. And you can break it down. You can work out exactly what it is in the models that gives you this predictability, that gives you this skill. And I'm sure to, to almost nobody's surprise, the answer is the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now. The big issue, of course, is the future. Right? Uh, if we had observations of the future, we obviously would trust them more than models. Right? But unfortunately, observations of the future are not available at this time. So how do we deal with that? It turns out that the largest uncertainty about what's going to happen over to the climate over the next 100 years is what we will do. Right? There's three different scenarios here. Um, one is uh, described as, as business as usual. You could also describe that as burn it all. Just burn it all. And that is what's going to happen. Um, the, uh, the aggressive mitigation uh, scenario would be something that would be comparable to the, uh, the limits that, that, that are aspired to in the Paris Climate Accord. 
Um, and then the serious mitigation is something in between, you know, where we make a serious effort not to burn it all, but we're not as successful as, as our aspirations are. Now, I think if we had to say what's more likely, the one in the middle is more likely than the ones at the ends. Um, and uh, th there's some very interesting issues here, right? So, so what happens in this business as usual world, right? So where it, where it's all saturated and it's the, that's that's more than four degrees, uh, more than more than uh, kind of roughly eight eight degrees Fahrenheit are warmer than than the present. And just for a sense of scale, the last ice age, which where we are, occurred about twenty thousand years ago. The last ice age, totally different planet, was only about eight degrees Fahrenheit colder than the 19th century, right? So this is like one whole ice age unit in the other direction. And if you think that the ice age was a totally different world, which it was, that too will be a totally different world. Do I know all of the details about exactly how that will be a different world? No, I don't. Uh, we, we don't have any observed examples of a planet like this because the last time the planet looked like this it was three million years ago and the amount of information that we have from three million years ago is, is not zero but it's not, uh, it's not very deep either. So is that future knowable? It's a very good question. Um, so when I was preparing this talk, I thought, you know, who, who else has, has thought about the feedbacks of, of human knowledge and prediction? And, uh, and I went back to, uh, to the Foundation Trilogy. Some of you, uh, I'm sure, read that. Uh, and psychohistory is this, this imaginary um, discipline that uh, invented by Harry Seldon, obviously invented by Isaac Asimov, um, where, you know, he tries to predict the behavior of human populations in a kind of statistical, mechanical way. If there's enough people, then it has to move in this direction except for random events that happen. But the, he comes up with a couple of axioms, and the second axiom of, of psychohistory is, is the following, that the population should remain in ignorance of the application of this theory, uh, because if it was aware that their behavior was predictable, the group would change its behavior, right? There would be, there would be a feedback. And if there is a feedback from your predictions to what you're predicting, it becomes very, very difficult indeed. But that's exactly the situation that we're in. We are making predictions for what might happen under various scenarios. And slowly, and perhaps not sufficiently, society is reacting. So are we then able to predict where we're going to end up in any kind of uh, uh, deterministic sense? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Uh, Roger Revell who was a, uh, a geochemist uh, at, at Scripps, um, uh, said, I think, uh, in, the, in the 1950s, uh, human beings are now carrying out a large-scale geophysical experiment of a kind that could not have happened in the past, uh, nor be reproduced in the future. So it is essentially unknowable what the outcome of this will be until we get there. So, unknowability. I think we have to be clear that unknowability is different from, what the, from, from things of which we are simply ignorant. Right? There are many things that I don't know, but I could find out. There are some things that I can never know. And I think that, that that's, that's, a, that's a crucial difference. And, and in climate science, there are some things that we can never know. And there are some things that we probably don't want to ever know, right? There are some of these scenarios, some of these paths, which we would be extremely foolish to tread. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks for those wonderful talks. Uh, I guess I'll lead a few minutes of discussion or maybe something like half our remaining time. And then after that, uh, if people who have questions want to come to the either of the two uh, thingies, microphones Mice. on either side, <laughs> um, that would be great. So I guess just to, to start with, uh, Gavin, since we're on the subject of uh, your talk right now. Um, so 
I think that a lot of climate skeptics, or maybe the, the smart ones, are skeptical for exactly the reason that, um, uh, that we've been talking about, that mm -hmm. um, they kind of can't imagine that we could possibly know what the, the planet will do. Right. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk about, uh, maybe you have an answer to this already, but why should we trust these models when you've been talking about how there's art and all of this right. involved? Okay, so um, here, here are reasons not to trust the models, right? You don't trust models just because they're complicated and they have great graphics, right? Those are not reasons to trust models. Uh, you don't trust them because they come with the, uh, the patina of authority from NASA or from NOAA or from MIT or something like that, okay? Those are terrible reasons to trust models. How do you trust models? You trust models because they have demonstrated skill. You demonstrate that skill, and where you've demonstrated that skill, you can have confidence that those models are telling you something useful. It's not that they're right, they're telling you something useful that you did not already know. And so you can ask the questions, are these models skillful? And the, and, and the answer is yes, they're, they're skillful uh, over the 20th century. If you look at the long-term trends, they're skillful when they predict the responses to, uh, to big volcanic eruptions uh, ahead of time. They've been skillful. We've been making predictions of decadal temperature change uh, for the last uh, 40 years, and those predictions have been skillful. Um, they've been skillful uh, not just in the global mean temperature, but the patterns of temperature, the, the responses in water vapor, the responses in rainfall, the responses in sea level. All of those things were predicted well before they were observed. And so I can, I can, I can go through a, a, basically a litany of all the things that were predicted by climate models before they actually occurred. And so that's the test. So, that, so, so, so if somebody says, well, you can't trust those models because of chaos, because of uncertainty, you say, well, how do you explain the fact that they predicted all these things skillfully? So, so that's, that's, that's my answer to that. Though, generally speaking, it's not terribly convincing because the reason why people don't want to believe climate models has got nothing to do with their epistemological values about the nature of knowledge. It has to do with something else entirely. <laughs> By the way, feel free to chime in um, or ask questions of your own and all this. So, uh, to, so to, to Gregory, um, so you didn't talk so much about the, the halting problem, which again is whether a computer program will, uh, will halt or get into an infinite loop. But uh, I wanted to ask you about kind of a related question, which is, um, the kind of the relationship basically between infinity and unknowability, um, which seem kind of tied together. So a lot of the, the questions, the mathematical questions that can't be answered, seem to relate to infinity. Um, there's the continuum hypothesis, which basically asks about the sizes of infinity, um, which there are infinities of different sizes, um, which might be shocking. But so this question is whether uh, is about whether basically the two smallest ones are actually the, the smallest ones or if there's one in between. Um, so why is that an unknowable question and, or, and why is infinity so often tied together with, with unknowability? Well, you know, mathematics, as was pointed out yesterday, um, mathematics is simpler uh, than the real world and real life, right? Yeah, that's why it's, uh, you can prove things. Now, one of the ways it simplifies is by dealing with infinity. Infinity simplifies things. If you, there are infinitely many whole numbers, for example. Now, that's a mathematical fantasy. Have you ever seen infinitely many whole numbers? Computers don't calculate with infinitely many whole numbers. So as long as you're in a finite domain, in principle, there is no unknowability. You can just calculate and see what happens you know, for all the possible cases. It may take a long time. But in principle, so there's no unknowability. The unknowability, um, it might be that it, it would be too time consuming in a practical way to, to calculate all the cases and discover whether something is the case or not. But if you're just interested in a principal question of knowability and unknowability, it's only when you get the infinite that, that you get real unknowability, not just due to I don't have enough computation time or I haven't found a clever so they actually go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. I mean, you know, the omega number, if you want to take a certain point of view, uh, doesn't exist. You know, uh, there are people who claim that only everything we calculated with is finite. 
You know, uh, if it can't be done on a computer, it doesn't exist. If you take that, in a way, Gödel would have uh, agreed with this, pure mathematicians are the last people who are living in the theological world of the Middle Ages. Because we believe in the platonic world of ideas. We believe in infinity, you know, uh, the mind of God. Uh, people may not say that, but pure mathematicians sort of, wouldn't that be fair to say, John? We live in this, uh, in this fantasy world. It's, the reason we live in this fantasy world is that it's more beautiful, it's simpler, we can prove things. Whereas if we stay in the real world, then everything <laughs> is, is very difficult and you can't. So, so that's why, this is a simplification, it's a fantasy, we're dealing with unicorns. You know, but you, it's, a, it's a perfectly defendable philosophical position that it's all nonsense. Mm -hmm. This platonic there world of ideas doesn't exist and we're wasting, wasting our time. You know? There is some skepticism it's possible. Even among mathematicians about infinity, right? There's some people who kind of there choose were, different axioms that uh, do. Yeah, at the big, there were periods in mathematical history when these philosophical questions were, uh, you know, after David Hilbert, for example, there was an intuitionistic school that said that um, if you want to prove that something exists, you have to give a constructive proof, for example, Brouwer or Bishop. Um, you know, um, the, what happened eventually was that everybody said, let's just keep doing everything the way we've done it up to now because it's easier and the math looks nicer. You know, so that's, so, so all of that sort of passed, that period of philosophical reflection. And, and what happens with Gödel, Copinus theorem, for example, in a, I believe that it completely changes the nature, the question of what is pure mathematics and what is knowledge. I believe that Gödel really turns everything on its head. But pure mathematicians prefer to forget about it and just basically keep working as before in the hope that it won't affect their problem, mm. you know? And this is a reasonable attitude. Pure math is doing very well in spite of Gödel's incompleteness. Mm. You know, it's, it's advanced greatly since 1931. So there, you know, there's a serious issue as how much of an impact these, these uh, unknowability results impact the real mathematics that real mathematicians love and devote their lives to, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, well, one question uh, related to maybe I wasted my world. life working on all of this, you know, because it doesn't exist. <laughs> Nothing exists. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I was wondering. I've always kind of wondered, and somehow people don't talk about it very much, but um, how Gödel's incompleteness theorems, what they tell us about this quest for a physical theory of everything. Ah, physical theory for everything. Like, if you can't have a mathematical theory of everything, is this pursuit of these, like, underlying laws of physics just completely dead in the water? I don't think so. Um, uh, Turing's approach sounds more physical. He's talking about a machine. So, to a physicist, does it make sense to ask whether, uh, it's an idealized machine, right? No noise, et cetera, deterministic. Does it make sense to ask what will happen in the limit of unlimited time, whether it will ever halt or it will never halt? If that question makes sense, it's like, a, it's like what, a, what is it called, a capture state or something? There's a name in physics for a, a state, absorbing state, right? The halting is an absorbing state of a physical system. So it's re it looks a little bit like some questions that some kinds of theoretical physics look at. But if you have a very down-to-earth practical approach, you know, you're interested in what you can calculate about the weather in a reasonable amount of time, not in billions of years, not right. even in I, I, it, 100 it, years. Yeah, I mean, it's worth pointing out that my computer models halt all the time. <laughs> yeah, so... Especially the ones with the cards. <laughs> yes. Uh, so in, in practice, we're interested in what we can reasonably calculate uh, and know uh, f for all practical purposes. So pure mathematics is, so we're sort of like poets. But sometimes this poetry turns out to be useful. Versions of it can be used. For example, theoretical physics is built out of some very pretty mathematics. Now, there's a question of how much theoretical physics is infected by incompleteness or uncomputability. And um, um, I have a colleague uh, called Francisco Doria in Brazil who, uh, who's, who's looked at questions in theoretical physics which are, he's shown, are undecidable. For example, if you write down a set of equations, can you decide if it's a chaotic system or not? And it turns out you can't. Hmm. It's, it's equivalent to the Holton question. But are these, you know, would a physicist say that this is a, a real problem that a physicist should be interested in? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we have a real <laughs> physicist here, right? You would always add another act. 
Mm-hmm. And you would feel I mean, comfortable. Theory, you, you know, for example, you've got five, 10 to 500 ground states. Uh, it is an uncomputable problem to explore the more computational. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in all sorts of situations, non-computability does certainly pop up. Mm-hmm. But that's, again, it's, you know, it's a rather specific issue. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it, it will be very surprising if there were no impacts between non-computability and Mm-hmm. There's lots of dynamics that's really very chaotic in galactic dynamics and planetary yeah. systems. Yeah, lots of these well, there's an interesting issue whether you can simulate a universal Turing machine with uh, Newtonian mass points and gravity and uh, inverse square gravity. That's a, I think it's an open question. I have some colleagues who, who would love to come up with an answer to that question. It's but but, but that a, involves uh, infinite precision, infinite precision. Uh, so th- this is an issue that, yeah, I, I could talk about it all day, but yeah, maybe... I'm happy um, to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> can um, I, can so I make a comment? To oh, my yeah, of here? course. Uh, my wife, whose field is epistemology, uh, I don't know where she got this, maybe from Popper or maybe from... Maybe she invented herself. She says, only when you fail, you touch reality. Oh, That's like that. related to your... Yes. Uh, to your... Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I do think that's true. I mean, that's where you really... You know, that's where you get to what we, you do an experiment because you don't know something and then it doesn't work and now you've really found out that you yeah. don't know something I, you didn't know. I would know. agree with you totally that what is absolutely fatal for the advance of science is if that you think you know everything. If you think you know everything, any new thing will be rejected. Any new experiment, you'll say, oh, it's experimental error, right? And that's it. And you, so, and that, yeah. that mm-hmm. is really a, and there's a wonderful book by Sabin, is it Hossenfelder? Oh, yeah, Betrayed by Beauty? Yeah. Talking about the sociology of high energy physics. It's a wonderful it's book that I don't think high energy physics physicists like, like at much, all. Yes, I think not either. Uh, she's probably committed career suicide yeah. by she's writing the book. <laughs> but she talks about the sociology of, uh, of mm-hmm. thinking they, you know, that you have the final answer. And so also, you see, it's a. Uh, well, let's get some yeah. biology in here. Yeah, let's get some. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you didn't talk much about your own research, but uh, this issue of perception and uh, smell, which is a private phenomenon. I mean, it's a we each well, have our can be smell. public, but <laughs> 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 one hopes it's right. mostly <laughs> private. Yes. Okay. Um, so I guess it it's sort of like um, Thomas Nagel his famous point in what is it like to be a bat, uh, that consciousness is also a private subjective experience. And so how can there be an objective theory of consciousness that um, explains everyone else having different versions of consciousness? If you and I had the same exact brain with the same neurons, we would still have separate uh, experiences of consciousness. And I think smell and uh, each of us having our own perception of how something smells is similar to that. And I wonder if you could talk about like whether science is kind of making progress on understanding perception, um, whether we could ever you know, resolve Nagel's kind of paradox. I Big question. I'm just trying to measure <laughs> which a few years ago didn't exist. Uh, there's fee. Uh, this is one. Oh, of, oh yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. For example, um, so uh, that 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 is, I think, uh, something that we didn't have before, and mm-hmm. it's definitely mm-hmm. a step forward, whether it's right or wrong. So, so <laughs> well, <laughs> if it's wrong, it's not a step forward, is it? <laughs> I would say that. Uh, I mean, I think there's an interesting sort of sea change going on at the moment in this area, and and. Um, I, I suspect we'll hear more about it later. But so for a long time, we believed that along the lines of Nagel's question that some other sensory perception is a window on consciousness, that we can use sensory perception or sensory perception questions to kind of get at consciousness in some maybe indirect, but it's the only thing we have way. But, but a, a lot of what's going on in, sense, in the world of sensory physiology or sensory neuroscience now sort of upends that a bit, I think. Because a lot of it was, was, there's a very famous paper from 50 or 60 years ago by a fellow named Jerry Ledfin, who was a physiologist, vision physiologist, who wrote this very influential paper. He's from MIT. He studied the visual system of the frog, and he said what the frog's brain is telling, the, what the frog's eye tells the frog's brain. 
And this actually directed sensory research for many, many decades. The idea was always trying to figure out what the sensory organ is telling the brain. And is it telling every brain the same thing? Is every brain interpreting it the same way? <coughs> I think we now recognize that this is probably not the way it works, actually. That sensory system, that it's almost the other way around. The question should be, what is the brain asking the eye? What is the brain asking the nose? That the brain is actually regularly interrogating the environment and using your senses to do it. And it's not just simply receiving in all sorts of stuff integrating it, interpreting it, and then behaving. But rather, it's making predictions about the world, it's setting up behaviors, it's, it's essentially a behavioral organ, as it were, and it's interrogating the environment. Now, that gives it, a, to me, a very different perspective from the level of consciousness. What does your brain want to know about the environment? And, and who in there is telling it to do that? Why is that easier? <laughs> is that an easier question? Oh, I don't think it's an easier question, actually. Mm -hmm. I think it's a more difficult question, mm -hmm. but, but I think it, but I, I think it doesn't allow us that sort of simple window of perception into consciousness. That is, do you see red the same way I see red? I don't think the brain gives a shit, actually. <laughs> it just but wants, I, but, I mean, wants to know if red is something to avoid. As long as I see it as an avoidable thing, then you, know, you could do the same if you want. I mean, but, but that gives you an insight, I think, into... So, so what the brain is doing is it's making a model of the real world yes. and interrogating your senses to see whether that's tr that's true, that's changed. Yes. And actually, it goes into a lot of the the issues of you know why why do we perceive visual illusions, right? Why why do we think things are moving when they're not moving? Why why, why are they the same line but they're not the same line? Or uh, or why did we not see the gorilla in the middle of the basketball game, right? You know, if 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 we were just absorbing all of the information then these things would be impossible. But, but because we're only selectively viewing uh, right. the outside world or discussions of the outside world uh, based on our own mental model about how things work, it actually, um, uh, you know, that, that, yes, that explains a lot. Yes, altering that information. I mean, you know, there, there, there is no, our visual systems don't see three dimensions. I mean, we all believe there's a third dimension and are seeing it. But your retina in the back of your eye is a flat sheet of cells. It takes the three-dimensional world and turns it into two dimensions. It loses an entire dimension of information, which the brain has to then make up again somehow or another by a process we have, as far as I know, little little insight into. Mm -hmm. say the smartest thing I've ever heard said about the brain was a comic named Demo Phillips. He's from, I think he's Los Angeles, West Coast comic, who, who said, I always thought my brain was the most interesting, wonderful organ in my body. And then one day I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, who's telling me that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I realize, well, I mean, all bets are off here, really. <laughs> yes. yeah. So do you have, like, a best current answer to the question that your lab is working on of how do we smell? Oh, no, we, in fact, we're just about to undo the answer we thought we had. <laughs> Which is always, in, in many ways, more fun, of course. It's just... I just didn't see that coming. So, so we, we all thought, you know, there's a large number of receptors in your nose and they bind different odors and we thought it would be some kind of combinatorial code that we could detect all these different odors and discriminate them, much the way you have three receptors in your eye for, you know, blue, red, and green wavelengths of light and you just combine them in ways to see hundreds of thousands or more colors. So we thought that would be the way olfaction worked too. With a thousand receptors and a hundred thousand odors, the numbers are bigger, but you know, computable somehow or another, if you will. But now we realize that not only do some odors activate receptors, but in a blend they will antagonize or compete with the receptor with another odor. And so you can't just put a big matrix on the wall and say, here are all the receptors, here are the odors, and check the boxes for who activates what because they don't only activate, they inactivate as well. They compete, and that, she had a whole layer of, oh, God. <laughs> should really be getting back to the lab. <laughs> so, Gavin, I wanted to ask you about, uh, or to talk a bit about the Silurian hypothesis. So Gavin had a really interesting paper out last year, um, basically said that there might have been an industrial coal burning species uh, that lived on Earth like 56 million years ago that created this global warming event that's not super well understood um, and that we might not know at this point that that had happened. Right, no, let, me, let me rephrase yeah. that slightly. So, so the issue is, 
uh, given the mark that we're making on the planet in geological systems, in the oceans, in isotopes, in, in geochemistry, uh, we will be we 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 are already making you know a, a geological um, uh, fingerprint that will be visible for for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, but of course, there have been other things that have happened in hundreds of millions of years of, of Earth history, and uh, the question that we were asking was. Uh, it's somewhat of a negative question, but but it's like, uh, given the similarities between our current Anthropocene fingerprint and these prior fingerprints that happened, you know, 50 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago, uh, can we rule out a similar cause? And the more you drill into it, it turns out uh, the harder it is to say something. Now, you're trying to prove a negative, which is obviously uh, always a little bit tricky. Um, but up until we wrote that paper, it turns out that almost nobody had thought about this, which was odd, because you would think that, you know, uh, with a planet that, that's been, you know, livable uh, on the surface for about 400 million years, uh, and our you know, our rise as a species, say, you know, six million years, and our rise as an inter in industrial uh, species, um, which has only lasted, you know, maybe 10,000 years. Uh, that's a very, very short amount of time in the vast reaches of geological history. Why has it only happened once? And and so I mean this is this is really it's, I mean it's an astrobiological question because I mean I work for NASA we're interested in you know what we can detect in in the rest of the solar system and in, in on exoplanets about you know other intelligences other 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 civilizations uh, but it was it was the first time that people had really kind of kind of drilled down into <coughs> what our limits of knowledge are for the for the past history of the Earth and uh, and it's been a very interesting response to that. <laughs> Yeah, so so you decided that there actually could have been this previous species, and we wouldn't know. But uh, well, well I, I said well. So so the conclusion that we that we came to, which was a little fuzzy, which was that it's very hard to tell, and because we haven't looked, uh, it, I mean, we're, so you know, we're in the dark room, and there might be a cat, but we haven't even opened, we haven't even got into the box to have a look to see if there's a cat or not, mm -hmm. um, and so there might not be any cats. Uh, but we haven't done the right experiments to to tell whether there is or not, um, and so uh, so that that's it's kind of actually led to you know some people looking for some rather exotic things in the, in old sediments. Uh, so far, they haven't found anything, but uh, I'm I'm sure they'll let me know if they do. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have questions for each other that you'd like to ask, and um, people can also start. Kind of we're just going to do running mics, actually, so oh, they can okay. raise their hands. Okay, yeah, anyone who has questions will be okay. Oh, can I make a quick comment oh, while sure. you're doing this? I, I just what you brought up about mathematics and biology that occurred to me was uh, one, of the, one of the enduring puzzles, in a way, was is that Darwin came up with this uh, remarkable theory of evolution and then spent the rest of his life going down blind alleys trying to figure out how it actually worked. You know, I mean, he never came up with the gene. He had all the information, at least in theory, to have done that, but was never able to come up with an idea of the gene. Curiously, of course, we now know at the same time, or more or less concurrently, Mendel did come up with the idea of the gene. And it's interesting that you could say Mendel was the first mathematical biologist, and that the idea of the gene required a mathematical <coughs> model to conceive of it. That Darwin was unable to conceive of the gene because he didn't have the mathematical description of evolution occurring that Mendel had who just said, well, well it's got to be something, it's got to be a particle that has this behavior and is a gene. No, right, that was, uh, Mendel was where, was it Poland? Did he publish? Uh, Austria. Austria, he published in a very obscure. Well, supposedly obscure, <coughs> people knew about it. I mean. They did? Yeah, and I mean. Yeah, but Darwin his, didn't. Darwin didn't. His argument really, was, was based on the fact that as a country gentleman, uh, people would breed uh, prize horses, they would mm -hmm. breed beautiful roses, uh, and he saw evolution taking place all the time with artificial selection done by um, right, right. His, his, uh, the people in his social set would, would have yeah. vast amounts of land and things like that. So, so it was a natural, he saw evolution taking place, so it was a natural 
He didn't need to know the mechanisms. He knew right, but he did selection have, worked. Yes, but, but he did he spend quite a bit of time looking for the mechanism and was yeah. never able to really succeed at coming up with it. Uh, I'm not... Well, this, this is the problem. Is, you know, <laughs> what do you do? What do you do after doing a great piece of work? Yeah, yeah. Well, what do you do with the rest <laughs> of your life? And Darwin didn't want to stop, so he kept yeah. he kept publishing books on some of them on rather obscure topics. We think like coral reefs. Yeah. And I don't know if beetles were another one of his uh, enthusiasms. Worms. I think. Worms uh, and he, barnacles. Yeah, he was a he was a naturalist, and he was interested in everything. Uh, his his theory on coral reef formation and atoll formation is still current theory. So mm -hmm. there was there was good stuff too. It's all good stuff. Yeah, he didn't want to stop working. Yeah, I just found it interesting that that it sort of required a mathematical approach to come up with what we now recognize as this good point. Mechanism, and you know? from there we have uh, a theory a beautiful mathematical theory which helped to convince people to take Darwin's theory seriously. Uh, it wasn't just genetics, it was it's called population genetics. It's yes, a mathematical... Yes. Well, Haldane was, was, was one of the pioneers. Yes, the area, really, right, 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 right. Uh, of course. Mm. But to, to, wait, wait, for, wait for a mic, because other, otherwise people won't be able to hear you. My two part, this is a wonderful conference. My two-part question, this assumption, uh, I mean, this impulse to explain everything mathematically, everything. Um, I'm just wondering, this is just a kind of a priori assumption that everything ultimately can be explained mathematically. Secondly, that implies there's no such thing as qualitative phenomenon. Well, I don't. I don't think that God necessarily should be explained no, mathematically, or love, I'm or or politics. Uh, no, I'm talking about poetry, philosophy, mental illness, a baby sure. smile, serendipity. Right. This w th this session is is more in the direction of the exact sciences, uh, and other sessions are dealing with precisely the issues uh, that you're talking about. Yesterday we had someone talk about literature. For example, uh, archaeology and ancient history. So uh, the new school certainly doesn't think that everything is the exact sciences. On the contrary, right? right. So no, I'm I, not uh, asking the origin of this impulse to explain everything mathematically. You just well, well, not everyone well, has well, this impulse. I no, happen no, to be no, a victim. Fortunately, not everyone has. Okay, one one at a time, please. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, let me let me let me address that. So, so uh, in the physical sciences, the the reason why uh, you know modeling as a as a way to make useful predictions uh, has continued and has de and has developed since the days of the punch card is because it works because it has increasing success and then it has demonstrated increasing success. But it do but but I don't, I don't think there's ever a, a claim that it's that it can be skillful across all questions. It's skillful in the questions that have been applied and. There are places where, I mean, as, as, as I, try, I tried to show, that, that it's never going to be successful. So, uh, but the reason why we pursue mathematical modeling of physical systems is because, for the most part, it works. Um, you know, there are some dead ends, like economics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it was a joke. There was a there was a joke. Everyone really laughed. I mean, doesn't matter. But I think you're right. There could never be a mathematical model of a baby's smile or the joy that you get. Some things are so complicated that well, that's very simple. You, you can have a mathematical description of anything, the baby's smile, whatever you like, but it's not necessarily useful. It doesn't add anything to the story. Einstein once said you could record a Beethoven symphony as a graph of an air pressure curve with time, mm -hmm. but why would you do that? <laughs> so, so you can describe anything mathematically, but you don't necessarily learn anything new. It's just a code, you know, changing the words and the pictures for symbols. So the point of the mathematics is to be able to use the logic to generate some new prediction, to see whether mm -hmm the mathematical model is able to make predictions you can test. So it's stupid to use mathematics to uh, present to describe certain subjects. You only got to read sociology books by Talcott Parsons to see you know, what happens if you use mathematics in situations where the problems are beautiful. Right. There's also the fact that increasingly computer models are used, not mathematics. You know, in the old days, when I was a child, a book on physics, you, you write down the equations and you get an analytic solution. 
Now, those are considered to be ridiculously simple, oversimplified situations now. Mm -hmm. When you deal with more complicated situations, you need to do computer numerical solutions. You can't write down an analytic right. closed form a solution to anything of any interest. Right, because there's no point in having an exact answer to the problem that's not relevant. It's much better to have an approximate answer to a problem that actually people care about. Right. The gentleman in the green is first, and then we can go next. Uh, Professor Chaitin referenced metamathematics in his presentation. What can be said about the potential from, for proving from without a system those true statements that cannot be proven from the axioms within the, st within the system? Yeah, well, uh, several of us refer to, to that. Yeah, it's, that can happen, of course. Um, my personal belief is that the, what incompleteness implies is that pure mathematics is a quasi-empirical science and you have to be prepared to add new concepts and new axioms because they're useful for pragmatic reasons. So the system is, you refer to this a little bit, John, the system will have to constantly grow as you attempt to understand larger and larger mathematical worlds. For example, this actually happens, for example, in mathematical cryptography. People would like to prove that crypto, crypto systems are secure, but they can't. So the way they work, uh, I would submit, is rather similar to the way theoretical physics, physicists work. You know, they're not giving absolute proofs that crypto systems are secure. Based on certain hypotheses that the community accepts, they are secure. But those hypotheses could be wrong, and they vary as a function of time, just like physical theory varies as a function of time. So this is a, a way of doing mathematics more similar to the way uh, physicists, uh, theoretical physicists would work. Uh, thank you for those wonderful presentations. Um, there is a kind of unknowability, which is uh, in one sense the most known of all. Uh, for example, uh, St. Augustine, I think he said about time that if you ask me uh, what it is, I know not. But if you do not ask me, I know what it is. <laughs> so there are a lot of things which we, are, which we have in first-person experience, like smell, for example, or sight. Um, so when you study that in science, you, we seem to be learning a lot about the nose and the receptors and about uh, odors or about the eye and the, uh, the ner nervous system. But the actual first-person experience of seeing and smelling or see, uh, even thinking, remembering, uh, that there seems to be a gap, an explanatory gap that there see, doesn't seem to, that it's not bridged. It's like water into wine. <laughs> this, uh, um, I'm talking about what Chalmers calls the, uh, the hard problem of consciousness, I think. What would you say about that? I, I'm sure Nick will have a great deal I know. about that this <laughs> afternoon. So, so I don't... I don't want to pretend to say too much about it, except that, I mean, this is what I tell students in my neuroscience class at Columbia, that uh, the, the biggest problem to, I think, understanding the brain is having one. And, and I don't mean that it's too stupid to do it. I think the brain, I believe the brain is actually quite capable of understanding how it works. The obstacle is the first person experience of having one, which again and again seems to have little or nothing to do with the, if you will, the third person mechanisms that are at work. And many of those mechanisms I think we still don't know. There are a lot of people now who are interested in the idea of energetics. You know, the brain weighs, to, uh, accounts for about two to three percent of your body weight but it uses 20% of your body's energy. And that doesn't even keep it warm. I mean, it can't even keep itself warm doing that. That's just to operate it. It keeps itself warm by blood flow. So, so it's a, a huge energy hog. What is it doing? And it turns out that energy calculations may be the most important that, way to advance understanding the brain. But you have no, abs you absolutely have no access to that in the first person. Um, and so that is, a, that is a problem. I mean, I think that's an obstacle, the, the way it feels. But you have to develop, and I think this is true in general in science and, and in this area of knowability, one of the, one of the great capabilities that science um, uh, uh, engenders in people or develops in people and could develop in anybody, you don't have to be an expert to do this, is a sense of the counterintuitive, a willingness to believe in the counterintuitive. People say, oh, scientists make discoveries by having intuition. I think they make discoveries by having counterintuition, that they're willing to believe things like 
you know, this is not flat, this planet, and it's not still, and all the rest of that. And the same thing is true of the brain. I think you have to be willing to really entertain very, very counterintuitive feeling ideas. That's just the gap that there is, yes. Uh, you can go first. <coughs> You'll be next. Thank you. Um, there have been exploded on this planet uh, over 2,000 atomic and nuclear bombs. And my question is to Mr. Uh, Chatlin. You were talking about, as far as the energy problem, we abandoned thorium reactors in the 1960s, uh, which were operational uh, for four years, and, but they didn't produce weapon grades uh, uranium, uh, but actually were very fail safe. In 1920, Ludwig von Mises wrote an essay which pertains to this economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth, uh, which really has been a forgotten essay. Uh, but it has been expounded on by uh, Joseph Salerno, and it dealt with as far as from an a priori manner, it was a 90-page uh, essay, that the state is not able to calculate down to what the taxpayer wants, and uh, that it is not able to provide the goods and services that the taxpayer uh, needs. This, I think, can be expanded into many other fields as far as mathematics, and I'm kind of curious, as we get to a larger state that is uh, much more centralized and not decentralized, do we not, in, uh, could it not be proven that we increase the risk in the system? That the risk in the system uh, environmentally, uh, as far as weapons, and this ties back to the atomic bombs, is that we are making the planet much more unsafe due to this distortion that happens from the ultimate taxpayer, the consumer, where we're increasing the risk on the planet? And how would one prove that mathematically? Uh, I don't think mathematics is appropriate. I don't understand really what you said, but as far as I can see, um, it, um, I don't think, uh, well, mathematics can be applied to, to everything, right? The question is, does it help at all? For complicated things, uh, you know, it's not a magic wand that works for everything. Usually mathematics works beautifully for toy situations. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing is, is very much not a toy situation. It's an extremely complicated, messy th thing, uh, including politics and all kinds of things. And uh, I, I wouldn't, exp you know, there were moments when people thought that there would be a Newton for sociology. You know, and that hasn't happened. There are no simple set of equations uh, for you, right? Yeah. Okay, so I, not to say that what you're talking about, I didn't understand it, but <laughs> it sounded important. Well, but, I, uh, okay. but, but, but I don't think that pure mathematics right. has much to contribute to this right. important I mean, so that, I mean, what, what you said actually actually uh, resonates a little bit with me. It's, um, you know, we, we, we do spend a lot of time trying to mitigate against uh, a lot of energy and effort and money, trying to mitigate against small problems, right? Um, we, uh, we build sewer systems to, to, to deal with the, the waste, and, uh, and, we're, and we're happier for that, right? You know, uh, we've built transport systems to, to mitigate against uh, the horse manure. Uh, we've built seawalls to mitigate against um, uh, sea level rise. And every time you do that, you add an extra layer of complexity to the society that we have. So the society we have now, is, it, it, you know, it's, it's far more people, far more moving parts, far more infrastructure. And a lot of it is fixed. A lot of it is very uh, immobile. Uh, and it has made us uh, more resilient to small changes. But the problem with building complex systems is that they can have catastrophic failures uh, when uh, some tolerance is, is, is breached. And, and you know, and the, the classic example would be New Orleans. As until the water uh, went through, until the levees burst, uh, it was totally. Well, it wasn't a very functioning city, <laughs> um, but it was. Uh, but it was. You know, I mean, people were living there, and and then you know, the storm comes, the levees burst, and it turns out that that massively engineered solution. Uh, was resilient up to a point, but then catastrophically failed. And so the 
uh, the danger that we have is that we continue to build small and more resilient things, but they're only resilient to small changes. And then when you have big changes, whether it's climate change, whether it's war, whether it's a, a drought, whether it's whatever it is, uh, then those systems collapse. And, and, we, and we've seen that in, in uh, play out in many societies. They collapse on a much larger scale than they would otherwise. Yes. Right? Uh, well, uh, yes, except that that's not actually what the society is choosing to do. So I think we maybe only have time for one more question, actually. But so I think it was you and okay. Uh, so uh, I guess the thing on a lot of people's minds, and in, in not just uh, academia these days, but also the um, business world, is is artificial intelligence and. So uh, I'm wondering um, how uh, things in that field tie together with unknowability, like whether topics like the uh, alignment problem of AI and you know coming up with um, things you're trying to optimize and and not getting unexpected consequences. Um, you know, AI is all about optimization. So mm -hmm. I, I, I wondered if anyone had thoughts of unknowability in uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So, I mean, we've had a couple of examples of that in, in, in our field. And so p uh, people like in the earth sciences are kind of playing around with, with some of these things and it hasn't had the success that it's had in, in things like, you know, Facebook algorithms and, and the like. And, and part of the problem is is that once your artificial intelligence system, you know, is optimized on whatever training data it has, and it then it produces predictions, uh, it turns out that you have no idea what, it, why it's chosen the predictions that it's done, and it's almost, uh, in, in fact, it might even even be unknowable as to why it's doing what it's doing. Right? You have all the weights in the nodes and things, but you don't know why it's making a particular decision uh, the way that it is, and uh, and that makes it very tricky. And so people are saying, well, we could just use that. It doesn't matter. It's you know we, we we don't need to know the details. But it turns out that when you're looking at physical systems, you really do need to know why things are happening. And that's actually the the, the fundamental thing that we're trying to get to is why things are happening. And and in, and importing a lot of machine learning into that in a naive fashion uh, actually takes that away. And so that's possibly why in in our field it hasn't been super successful uh, to date. All right. Well. One PM. Um, so, thank you all so much. This is fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.